And even two years ago, we had in the press indication that the Permian ended with a great extinction caused by an impactor, and we had buckyballs thrown about. Buck Mr. Fullerene's carbon 60s, which were a new indicator of cometary impact. And yet we cannot, no laboratory in the world has been able to replicate those results. And in science, if you can't replicate it, it ain't true. In this particular case, no one can find any evidence of impact of a 90% species kill that's related to extraterrestrial causes. So what did it? Well, we have lots of bodies, and the bodies at the time are our distant relatives, mammalac reptiles. Well, there's been no movie ever made about mammalac reptiles. Culturally, these things were invisible. And yet prior to the age of dinosaurs, they're the dominant land animals. This is about two feet. It's a dicynodon. There are big nasty ones. This is the biggest carnivore of the time, a gorgonopsian. This is about a foot and a half to two feet, the skull. So we're looking at about an eight to nine foot creature that would have looked partially like a lion, but more like a lizard. So we're looking at a time when mammals aren't yet mammals. They're going from reptiles to mammals, but they're really verged, they're on the verge of becoming the age of mammals. This is 250 million years ago. So that age of dinosaurs is a colossal mistake. It should have never happened. There would have never been an age of dinosaurs except all these guys get wiped out. And what did it? If we want to understand planetary health and what kills planets, we might better know what is the nature of something that kills 90% of all species. Some of them are big. This is my little son Patrick being menaced by a plant-eating I signed it on. I mean, these are not trivial creatures. We have things as big as dinosaurs roaming the planet, and they're wiped out in very short order, and a comet and asteroid didn't do it. Child abuse. So here's a view of what the stuff might have looked like. They're four-legged. They're maybe scaly. They're not quite warm-blooded yet. Gaze ye upon your distant ancestors, because that was us. And here's what we think the world looks like at the end. Our best guess now is that what happens is that the Earth, all the continents coalesce together. And when they start pulling apart, when Gondwana land, ancient Gondwana land, and this huge supercontinent tear apart, a huge amount of carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. And in so doing, creates a heat, a time of heat that would be unbelievable to us. This is ancient global warming. Could global warming cause a 90% extinction? And if it can, Maybe we ought to think about SUVs. <laughs> now, happily, not everything dies out. And this is a find I made on one of my last collection trips there. This is a pen for scale. So this is tiny. This is about the size of a robin egg. It's an itty-bitty little skull just coming out of, this is what paleontologists have to find. You have to find them before they erode too much. But they have to have a little erosion or you never see them. And so here's his eye socket. He's got some little teeth here and little teeth here. This thing survives. This is in lower Triassic strata, and this is your direct ancestor. We are here in this room having this talk because this creature doesn't die out in that great mass extinction. This is a carnivore which gives rise to us, called a cynodont, and it is our stem ancestor which does survive this. So this one species gets through and gives rise to true mammals. If that species doesn't get through, what's the world like now? Who knows, but not like it is now. So we have these really sort of near-miss events in the lifetime of the planet. Well, there are bigger things out there. The KT kills 50% simply because it's only a 10-kilometer object. What if we were hit by common hail bop? We would definitely not be having this talk. <laughs> the bacteria would be saying, it's ours again. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> Thank goodness. All right, we're running the crowd out of the audience now. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's the truth. If hail bot had hit, hit us, there would not be animals on the planet. hail bop is so big, it would have sterilized animal life. It could potentially sterilize all life, but I think the bacteria would have survived it. But anything bigger than a paramecium would be dead on the planet. And the point is that most planetary systems have lots of comets out there. We have lots of comets out there. And what keeps us from getting bopped over and over and over is Jupiter. Our Jupiter protects us. Jupiter, it is estimated, keeps a majority of comets from hitting us. And we had the privilege in our lifetime with comet Shoemaker-Levy going into Jupiter to see that process. 
Jupiter is our planetary protector. In planetary systems, without Jupiter's, impact rates would be as much as 10,000 times higher. If you remove Jupiter from our system, we get hit 10,000 times more than we are. We don't have this conversation. So there are certain aspects to planetary systems necessary, even in long-lived systems, which I believe ours is. There's other bad stuff out there. Supernova nearby could potentially do it. We used to think the kill radius of a supernova would be one light year, and we now know it's 30 light years. A supernova within 30 light years blows off your ozone layer. A planet without ozone is a planet that gets an awful lot of radiation on its surface. Could it sterilize the planet? Probably not. Would it affect the biota? Certainly. We can expect, as we go around our big cosmic merry-go-round, to have three to five contacts of the 30 light year bubble in 500 million years. In the last 500 million years, then, statistically, five times we should have expected to be affected by a passing supernova. What else? Gamma ray bursts. I mean, there's some really nasty, bad animals out there. But the centers of galaxies are much, much worse than the edges, and we are out at an edge. The centers of galaxies, I believe, would not be habitable for very long for any planet. I think the com common Im impact rate, the radiation rate from bad things happening, the supernova rate being much higher makes the centers of galaxies perhaps uninhabitable for animals, great for bacteria. So let's look at what a doctor can do to look at planet Earth. If the past tells us we've had near misses, and the past also tells us that we could die from accident, let's look at how we might die from old age and how we can predict how that old age might take place. This is a box model in which in my PowerPoint presentation I lost some of the arrows. But these are the variables that a series of coupled equations take into account to produce estimates of the future habitability of the planet. And there's two aspects to it that are most important. Number one, how much carbon dioxide will be in our atmosphere? And number two, what will the temperature of the surface of the planet be? Well, temperature is kind of a nasty deal. I used this example last night, those in the audience. If you take a campfire and you put a person outside that campfire, as the fire burns down, you have to get closer and closer and closer during the night or you're going to freeze. Except the sun works in exactly the opposite way. All stars on the main sequence, as you know in this audience, as hydrogen is burned to helium, the luminosity and the energy being put into space increases. Stars get hotter and hotter and hotter through time, but planets don't have any way of moving away from that. And so in all planetary systems that we could think of, stars are cool to begin with and get hotter. Planets, which are originally in nice warm places, get in really hot places. Those that are in cool places get warmer through time. If we want to understand the future of the Earth, we have to factor in this increase in solar luminosity. If we'd like to know how this affects heat and carbon dioxide, we've got to take in a lot of variables. We think about global temperatures, and what are the factors which affect global temperatures? Well, clearly, solar luminosity does. Turns out global biological productivity is affected by mean global temperature. How about atmospheric carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. The amount of greenhouse gases in your atmosphere are going to affect your global temperature. But they are affected by many things, including, most importantly, the rate of silicate rock weathering. Well, how could that be? Why are we in an ice age now? It used to be because, well, we thought carbon dioxide is getting lower and lower. Well, that's right. But why is it? And the reason it may be is the Himalayas. What? The rise of the Himalayas produced huge amounts of granite to the atmosphere. What happens? They weather. They're silicate rocks. And when they weather, what happens? Carbon is liberated. Calcium is liberated. The calcium combines with carbon dioxide and makes limestones, coral reefs. And it gets cooler. Carbon dioxide has been sucked out of the atmosphere over the last five million years in such quantity that it's led to glaciation. We have a thermostat, but the rate of silicate rock weathering is hugely important in that. What relates to that? The rate of continental drift, the rate of spreading, the size of the continents, geothermal heat flow, rate of continental growth, and all of this eventually works back to global biological productivity. 
So for 10 years, people have now been using these factors, which are just now being understood, to produce equations to predict the futures. The doctor looking at these data, trying to figure out how long do you have. And here are some of the results, fascinating results that have come out. Let's look first now at productivity. What productivity is, is the rate at which